Chapter 61 Do not feel alone, friend. You are listening at NovelFull.audio Chapter 61 Do not feel alone, friend. Magoo's writing stopped abruptly after day 433. The thin little diary seemed to be of great importance to him. Once he had finished recording his writings on the dozens of available pages, he continued adding more pages to the diary by sticking together different pieces of paper using tape. Judging from the paper quality, it was easy to tell that Magoo's quality of life was at its peak between day 200 and day 340 of the Doomsday Calendar. Be no L dem ever since the disaster on day 344 began, the development graph of Magoo's shelter seemed to drop gradually, before falling into a steep decline downward. All 19 disasters were jotted down clearly in the notebook. Su Mo did not find nerve acid rain, nor was there any record of blizzard. The only things found were the numbers used to measure the disasters. Extreme snowfall 72 hours, flood 72 hours, temperature, 30 degrees, 72 hours, alien beast stampede, 72 hours, temperature, below 30 degrees, 72 hours, meteorite impact, 30 meteorites, plant disease, 48 hours, temperature, 60 degrees, 24 hours, he briefly wondered if there was a problem with Magoo's recording, and whether it was possible that it was an issue of both games being different versions. There was no mention of novice protection for the disasters in the diary, nor were there any clear descriptors of the disasters. All he could see from those simple words were the human lives behind those disasters. Magoo had, more than once, speculated on the reason behind this baptism of disasters that had befallen humankind. However, he would debunk his previous speculation every time he formulated a new idea. Whether it was the beginning of an alien war, some prank of a high civilization, to the brain in a jar theory, or even fantastical cultivating deities, Magoo had extended his imagination to all possibilities. At the end of it all, reality was a harsh mistress, he was unable to hold on and unravel the secrets behind these disasters. Magoo's failure stemmed from his widespread planting of re-engineered crops without proper planning to prevent the start of plant disease disaster. This was the biggest mistake he made, and it was from this point onward that his accumulations from before turned into a giant joke. He had no choice but to sell all that he had stored in exchange for survival supplies. From the remnants of the mass graves, he successfully used his own methods to survive to the very end. After obtaining the plans and design for the thermal weapon device, he kept a low profile and bided his time. It was only when he had successfully manufactured it that he began to rise to a higher profile. He started his business by selling small dot scale thermal weapon devices and became somewhat well dot known. Unfortunately, he could not maintain his core business. Sigh, what a pity. Su Mo felt slightly bad for Magoo as he read through the regrets in the diary. Magoo was considered quite the legend to have been able to be part of the final 1%. However, one could only say that, if a person's luck was waning, he would not be able to last until the very end. With the motor dot pumped oil well in his hands and a superior shelter with two floors, Magoo had lived quite the life as a minor character. Even so, at that moment, Su Mo did not feel dejected nor lose hope for the future. Magoo had taken over 400 days to build and manage the shelter into what it was today, but it had only taken a week for Su Mo to nearly reach the same level as Magoo. Besides, I have the system. When I'm at my 400th day, my shelter's strength would surpass his by at least a few hundred times. Who knows, I might even have upgraded it into a psychic energy shelter by then. After keeping Magoo's diary in his storage space, Su Mo actually felt the gloominess within him disappear and he no longer feared facing the future. Only weaklings would fear the road ahead. They would be the ones who stopped in their tracks and lived a wretched life in search of survival. The strong would move forward with courage. As he groped in search of the gate in front of the cellar, he pulled twice on it to confirm that it had been damaged before summoning the system to examine its properties. Level 1 Alloy Shelter Main Cellar Door, Normal, Damaged, Description The cellar door was constructed from multiple different alloys. 
Currently, the hinge is difficult to operate due to the lack of maintenance. Upgrade option. Restoration, 20, dismantling, 450, material upgrade, 1100, electric altering, 750. Looks like it was just left unmaintained. I guess the hinge is stuck, but if all it needs is just 20 points, I can totally afford that. Since it only required a few points, Su Emmo chose restoration without hesitation. Another 20 points were taken off the remaining 31 survival points he had and a green light shot out. Two deep clanking sounds could be heard. Once again, Su Emmo tried to pull on the hinge next to the cellar door. This time, as expected, the door of the cellar began to rise slowly. Every time the hinge turned mechanically, the cellar door was able to rise about 10 centimeters. He turned it again and again until it was raised up to about two dot thirds of its total height. Su Emmo gave it one last forceful push and the hinge clicked downwards, locking it down between the fasteners. He waited for two or three minutes to make sure that the alloy door would not suddenly slam shut before finally feeling safe enough to return to the buggy. I'm finally about to drive this thing out, I'm afraid everyone on earth could never have imagined that I, Su Emmo, used only one week to obtain the greatest weapon to safely roam about in this world. He sat in the buggy as he stared at the wide dot open cellar door. Su Emmo felt the urge to show off and needed to express himself. He had obtained a vehicle in such a short time, and not being able to tell anybody about it was killing him. Being unable to return home to show off his success was like parading great dot looking clothes in the middle of the night. He turned on the dead man's direct message and Su Emmo sent ten continuous messages of, I've got a car. Satisfied, he closed the screen and fastened his safety belt. He pressed on the start button again to turn on the engine, and two smoky clouds rumbled out from the exhaust pipe. Vroom 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 vroom. Without a sound barrier, the sound of the engine's power could easily be heard, pouring in its entirety into Su Mo's eardrums, which rang in rhythm with the noise. The gear lever for the buggy was located in the center. There were only two gears. Forward and reverse. He stepped onto the brakes and clutched the gear lever, which was shaped like a drumstick. He gave the head push and there was a creaking noise. He had successfully engaged the gear. It was not long before Sumo's left foot slowly released its pressure on the brakes. The gradual release of the brakes caused the buggy to shudder. It was only after the brakes were released that the shuddering stopped and it began to move forward. Right then, it was impossible for Su Mo to tolerate moving at such a slow speed. His right foot immediately stepped on the accelerator and a low roar came from the engine. The next moment. The buggy was like an arrow that had just been released from a bow. It shot off with great force from where it had been originally situated. It took only one second before a dirt dot yellow shadow flashed out of the cellar. The low roar from the engine's horsepower echoed between the confines of heaven and earth. 20. 40. 60. Su Mo accelerated to a scary 60 yards in just an instant on the battered dirt road. There was no barrier or window shield, and the booming sound of the wind tore at the mask of the raincoat like a blade, howling loudly. Oreo, who was standing on high ground, saw the yellow shadow flash by and could no longer control her excitement within, howling like a wolf continuously. Su Emo drove faster and faster under the moonlight. The buggy's strong horsepower also brought with it a violent recoil. In addition to the strong, wind-defying howl in the air, one could not help but feel the adrenaline pumping through the veins. However, Su Emo still recalled that. Diesel. There's not much of it left. After four or five minutes of driving in circles, Su Emo drove the buggy back to the cellar door. Oreo anxiously paced about at the entrance of the cellar. When she saw Su Emo return, she became more excited than usual and immediately lunged toward the buggy, trying to bite its roll cage fiercely. It was as if she was interrogating it. You're the bad person that took my master away from me. Su Emo laughed and immediately rubbed Oreo's doggy head. 
he only stopped once the little girl's temper had been smoothed over. My shelter does not have room for parking yet. Once a disaster strikes, I would still need to park it at shelter number two. That being said, the creation platform at shelter number two can still be put back together before disaster strikes. He strode back into the shelter and placed the cellar hinge down, closing the cellar door. Sue M.O. returned to the first floor. He took out a wooden box that had been previously created in the base. Sue M.O. picked up Magoo's skull with great care and placed any large dot-sized bones he could find on the ground into the box. Big Brother Magoo, thank you for the car. There's not much I'm able to do for you except keep your bones in a safe place. If I'm able to return to Earth alive, I will be sure to bring your diary along with me. He bowed three times in gratitude to the wooden box before keeping it in his storage space. He climbed upward using the climbing rope. He then found the highest point of the hill and took out a shovel. He quickly dug a large hole and placed the box with Magoo's bones into it before starting to bury it. As he scooped up piles of dirt to cover up the box of bones under the moonlight, Sue M.O. muttered with feeling, Do not feel alone, friend. This is the highest point. Enjoy the good view of the starry sky and look upon this great land from the top. A day will come when humankind will take over this wasteland. A day will come when humankind will have our destinies returned into our own hands. Chapter 62 This is a small step to Chris, cross the wasteland, but You are listening at NovelFull.audio Chapter 62 this is a small step to Chris, cross the wasteland, but Readers are strongly recommended to listen to the vocal section of Hotel California while reading this chapter, Sue M.O. lifted his head under the boundless moonlight. It was as if he saw Magoo's smiling face outlined in the gray skies above, a true man who refused to give up. May his soul rest in peace. Holding Magoo's notebook, Sue M.O. felt the burden that he was carrying grow slightly heavier. However, it was not the time for mourning. He could hear Oreo's continuous barks from below, she was obviously curious about the buggy. Sue M.O. briefly covered the remaining traces on the ground before descending the hill at a brisk and light pace. There was a single dot seat cabin in the buggy, but Magoo had also added a rear compartment behind the engine, which Sue M.O. assumed was used to carry a small cargo load. Oreo was able to fit into that space perfectly. He sat Oreo down inside and buckled her in. Be careful and don't randomly move about. If you fall, you'll become a disabled dog. After he gave Oreo a warning, he looked at her sitting quietly in place. Sue M.O. smiled before returning to the front. He bent down and climbed into the buggy's cabin, buckling up before starting the engine like he usually did. The buggy's engine ignited and started humming. Oreo, who was sitting behind it, was clearly frightened by this, but as Sue M.O. had given her a reminder, she did not make any sudden moves. After making sure that everything was fine, Sue M.O. shifted the gear into drive and released the brakes. The buggy began to move slowly. Arf. Woof woof. Woof. Oreo looked around curiously, not understanding how she was moving forward despite sitting absolutely still. The next second, Sue M.O. stepped on the accelerator, and Oreo was fed with a gust of wind when she opened her mouth, woofing away. Arf woof, oh yeah. Sue M.O. shouted excitedly as he felt another gust of howling wind blowing past. The sound waves created by revving the engine were as good as the V8 luxury sports cars on Earth. The birds that were flying above in the sky were shocked and scattered in all directions. He moved his hand toward the radio and pressed on the music button. A song started to play, pulsing like a bass subwoofer through the quiet wasteland. On a dark desert highway, cool wind in my hair warm smell of Kalidas, rising up through the air up ahead in the distance, I saw a shimmering light my head grew heavy and my sight grew dim I had to stop for the night there she stood in the doorway I heard the mission bell and I was thinking to myself this could be heaven or this could be hell it was a classic song that Magoo had picked up somewhere. Together with Oreo's woofs, it echoed melodiously through the wasteland. 
Traveling at 40 km per hour, it wasn't long before he was back in front of the shelter, parked while waiting for a song to finish playing. With this speed, I'll have no issues paying a visit to Cobalt Saltpeter Mine tomorrow. Oreo was still slightly frightened, but seemed to still want to continue the ride, nudging Sue M.O. as she was being removed from the buggy. Sue M.O. had to prepare a garage for the buggy. That place would be, the gap that Huang Biao and the others had dug into previously. Those people were a big help to me. All I have to do is construct a sloped roof, put up some wooden boards, and it can serve as a temporary garage. Su Mo was all smiles as he took the shovel out and started work on their unfinished project. The construction progressed quickly with the help of Su Mo's good dot quality equipment. Su Mo easily dug out the slope within 10 minutes. At the other end of the slope was the surface of the shelter's stone walls. Although the temporary garage looked simple and crude, it was sufficient to guard against the mutant beasts. As for humans, Su Mo thought that there would be no one else who would be as daring as him to cross the wasteland at night. Even if there were, with Oreo's surveillance abilities and his cache of weapons, it would be akin to those people handing themselves to him on a silver platter. Back at the base, Su Mo quickly cut out a few wooden boards and took them out, laying them atop the slope and completing the simple garage construction project. Su Mo then went back to the buggy and, after examining the structure to make sure that there were no problems, he started it up and reversed perfectly into the garage. He then laid down a few wooden boards in front so that it looked like a wooden box had covered up the buggy. Great. Su Mo brushed off the dust on his shoulders, nodded his head satisfactorily, and went back to his base. My progress is way too fast. Just wait till my sister sees this. I'm afraid that she would never expect to have such an impressive brother. After drinking a mouthful of psychic energy water and making sure all the shelter doors were locked, Su Mo felt satisfied as he walked over to where the kobold was lying. Huh, it seems like someone's hungry, he patted its head. Su Mo finally recalled what he had forgotten when he was having dinner. The wound on the kobold mage had not worsened after its treatment with psychic energy water. While it looked like he was dying, it turned out to be only because he was hungry. Su Mo searched about and took out some biscuits mixed with psychic energy water and placed it in front of the kobold. The kobold mage should be kept alive before he found the location of the saltpeter mine in kobold's camp. Su Mo nodded as he looked at the kobold mage wolfing down the food, before heading back to the center of the base. There was no concept of time during the night in the wasteland. Everyone could only use the ancient method of telling the time by looking at the moon. It should be around midnight now, perhaps 11 or 12 o'clock. Too bad there's no nightlife in the wasteland. Su Mo tidied up the yellow dot stained clothes on him. He felt slightly disgusted and changed out of them. He then took a small cup of water out and rinsed his mouth at the culture medium. Little Spark and Big Spark had been preparing for sleep when they caught sight of Su Mo. They lifted their chicken heads in acknowledgement before continuing to sleep after that. Life's flourishing. I have a desk lamp and a heating pad. Su Mo's shelter is finally getting better. After rinsing his mouth, he went back to the supply storage and retrieved the desk lamp and heating pad that he had traded for in the morning. In the master bedroom, Su Mo laid the heating pad down, connected the desk lamp to the electricity supply, and finally laid down on his bed. Based on this progress speed, perhaps I can create gunpowder in a few days, or maybe even some upgraded explosives. By that time, Su Mo was excited just thinking about the possible treasures he would get from those kobolds. No way, I'm too excited. I won't be able to sleep like this. I should read some chat messages to calm myself down. The gentle light from the desk lamp filled the room with warmth. One could almost forget that they were in the middle of the wasteland. Instead, this almost seemed like a scene from a home in the rural countryside. Su Mo focused his mind while changing into a more comfortable resting position. The virtual game panel popped out immediately. Tapping on the world channel, the screen displayed the messages and news items one by one that were slowly flooding the screen. 
At this time of day, most people had already used up their trumpet counts, and the rest of them were filtered by the system. This made it easier to keep up with all the messages. As he was scrolling, he realized that there was news of the halflings. Su Mo then nodded his head and switched over to the regional channel. Halflings arrived into this world together with humans. Taking the speed of progress into account, many of them should have already encountered this strange creature, yet no one actually described its characteristics, only mentioning the need to be careful of them. In the days after the first disaster, the number of players in the regional channel had been reintegrated. Two days had passed since then, and there were still 982 people left out of the 1,000. 18 of them had been unlucky enough to encounter some form of danger, or unlucky circumstance, and died. As there were no speaking limits in the regional channel, there were dozens of them chattering away as if they were in a telegram group chat. Fei Ji. Brothers, I'm hungry. I'm lying on the floor of a wooden house with broken windows. My whole body is shivering. When will this end? Liang Jian. The bro above, you're so much better off than I am. I ate a pack of dried noodle snacks. I had diarrhea at night and it was so bad that I almost died from it. Liang Jian. Is there anyone who knows, can we eat what we've excreted? I don't have any grain reserves left, Na Wenqing. Liang Jian, I thought you told us that your shelter was good enough. Why does it sound so bad now? Has it gotten to the point that you have to eat your own sh asterisk tea? Liang Jian. Nice one. I bet this shelter will be done for in a few days. Last time, it was mutant beasts going after the humans, and now the humans are going after them instead. How ironic. Liang Jian. I'm toughing it out for now. Once the secret realm trading opens, I'll look for Su God to trade for something. Kai Jun Fong. What have you got there? Liang Jian. He, it's a secret. If everyone can keep surviving, just do it. We're lucky to have Su God in our channel. I heard that some of the other lousy channels lost half of their members. None of them were good enough to keep everyone's spirits up. Du Fu. I'm here to introduce something. The tree bark of some bushes are edible. I ate some of it today and it tasted fine. If you can't stand the hunger, go and get some. It's better than eating dirt. Emerald. Mr. Su Mo is able to eat his fill right. Sob, sob, sob. I'm so envious of him. Lily Helen. Sigh, I'm going to flee to another shelter for help in the world channel after I run out of food in two days. Ju Dong. The noob above, don't get fished. Lily Helen. Ha. Huh. What's fishing? Su Mo looked at the regional channel. His name had been mentioned a few times, and he could see the miscommunication caused by differences in Eastern and Western cultures. He smiled helplessly, then turned off the chat panel. If only they knew that he ate fried meat patties and biscuits with psychic energy water. The big and soft bed that he was sleeping on, covered by gentle lighting from the desk lamp at his bedside, even the cobalt he caught had psychic energy water with biscuit paste. Those people would go crazy with envy if they knew. All done. I'm going to sleep. Got to get up early tomorrow to explore the camp. Su Mo slowly fell asleep while thinking about the things he had to do the next day. He lifted his hand to switch off the desk lamp, and then the shelter turned quiet. Chapter 63 Eighth day in the wasteland, equipment upgraded you are listening at novel full dot audio. Chapter 63 Eighth day in the wasteland, equipment upgraded, readers are strongly recommended to listen to the vocal section of Hotel California while reading this chapter, Su Mo lifted his head under the boundless moonlight. It was as if he saw Magoo's smiling face outlined in the gray skies above, a true man who refused to give up. May his soul rest in peace. Holding Magoo's notebook, Su Mo felt the burden that he was carrying grow slightly heavier. However, it was not the time for mourning. He could hear Oreo's continuous barks from below, 
she was obviously curious about the buggy. Su Mo briefly covered the remaining traces on the ground before descending the hill at a brisk and light pace. There was a single dot seat cabin in the buggy, but Magoo had also added a rear compartment behind the engine, which Su Mo assumed was used to carry a small cargo load. Oreo was able to fit into that space perfectly. He sat Oreo down inside and buckled her in. Be careful and don't randomly move about. If you fall, you'll become a disabled dog. After he gave Oreo a warning, he looked at her sitting quietly in place. Su Mo smiled before returning to the front. He bent down and climbed into the buggy's cabin, buckling up before starting the engine like he usually did. The buggy's engine ignited and started humming. Oreo, who was sitting behind it, was clearly frightened by this, but as Su Mo had given her a reminder, she did not make any sudden moves. After making sure that everything was fine, Su Mo shifted the gear into drive and released the brakes. The buggy began to move slowly. Arf. Woof woof. Woof. Oreo looked around curiously, not understanding how she was moving forward despite sitting absolutely still. The next second, Su Mo stepped on the accelerator, and Oreo was fed with a gust of wind when she opened her mouth, woofing away. Arf woof, oh yeah. Su Mo shouted excitedly as he felt another gust of howling wind blowing past. The sound waves created by revving the engine were as good as the V8 luxury sports cars on Earth. The birds that were flying above in the sky were shocked and scattered in all directions. He moved his hand toward the radio and pressed on the music button. A song started to play, pulsing like a bass subwoofer through the quiet wasteland. On a dark desert highway, cool wind in my hair warm smell of Kalidas, rising up through the air up ahead in the distance, I saw a shimmering light my head grew heavy and my sight grew dim I had to stop for the night there she stood in the doorway I heard the mission bell and I was thinking to myself this could be heaven or this could be hell it was a classic song that Magoo had picked up somewhere. Together with Oreo's woofs, it echoed melodiously through the wasteland. Traveling at 40 kilometers per hour, it wasn't long before he was back in front of the shelter, parked while waiting for a song to finish playing. With this speed, I'll have no issues paying a visit to Cobalt Saltpeter Mine tomorrow. Oreo was still slightly frightened, but seemed to still want to continue the ride, nudging Su Mo as she was being removed from the buggy. Su Mo had to prepare a garage for the buggy. That place would be, the gap that Huang Biao and the others had dug into previously. Those people were a big help to me. All I have to do is construct a sloped roof, put up some wooden boards, and it can serve as a temporary garage. Su Mo was all smiles as he took the shovel out and started work on their unfinished project. The construction progressed quickly with the help of Su Mo's good dot quality equipment. Su Mo easily dug out the slope within 10 minutes. At the other end of the slope was the surface of the shelter's stone walls. Although the temporary garage looked simple and crude, it was sufficient to guard against the mutant beasts. As for humans, Su Mo thought that there would be no one else who would be as daring as him to cross the wasteland at night. Even if there were, with Oreo's surveillance abilities and his cache of weapons, it would be akin to those people handing themselves to him on a silver platter. Back at the base, Su Mo quickly cut out a few wooden boards and took them out, laying them atop the slope and completing the simple garage construction project. Su Mo then went back to the buggy and, after examining the structure to make sure that there were no problems, he started it up and reversed perfectly into the garage. He then laid down a few wooden boards in front so that it looked like a wooden box had covered up the buggy. Great. Su Mo brushed off the dust on his shoulders, nodded his head satisfactorily, and went back to his base. My progress is way too fast. Just wait till my sister sees this. I'm afraid that she would never expect to have such an impressive brother. After drinking a mouthful of psychic energy water and making sure all the shelter doors were locked, Su Mo felt satisfied as he walked over to where the kobold was lying. Huh, it seems like someone's hungry, he patted its head. Su Mo finally recalled what he had forgotten when he was having dinner. 
The wound on the cobalt mage had not worsened after its treatment with psychic energy water. While it looked like he was dying, it turned out to be only because he was hungry. Su Emo searched about and took out some biscuits mixed with psychic energy water and placed it in front of the cobalt. The cobalt mage should be kept alive before he found the location of the saltpeter mine in cobalt's camp. Su Emo nodded as he looked at the cobalt mage wolfing down the food, before heading back to the center of the base. There was no concept of time during the night in the wasteland. Everyone could only use the ancient method of telling the time by looking at the moon. It should be around midnight now, perhaps 11 or 12 o'clock. Too bad there's no nightlife in the wasteland. Su Emo tidied up the yellow dot stained clothes on him. He felt slightly disgusted and changed out of them. He then took a small cup of water out and rinsed his mouth at the culture medium. Little Spark and Big Spark had been preparing for sleep when they caught sight of Su Emo. They lifted their chicken heads in acknowledgement before continuing to sleep after that. Life's flourishing. I have a desk lamp and a heating pad. Su Mo's shelter is finally getting better. After rinsing his mouth, he went back to the supply storage and retrieved the desk lamp and heating pad that he had traded for in the morning. In the master bedroom, Su Emo laid the heating pad down, connected the desk lamp to the electricity supply, and finally laid down on his bed. Based on this progress speed, perhaps I can create gunpowder in a few days, or maybe even some upgraded explosives. By that time, Su Emo was excited just thinking about the possible treasures he would get from those kobolds. No way, I'm too excited. I won't be able to sleep like this. I should read some chat messages to calm myself down. The gentle light from the desk lamp filled the room with warmth. One could almost forget that they were in the middle of the wasteland. Instead, this almost seemed like a scene from a home in the rural countryside. Su Emo focused his mind while changing into a more comfortable resting position. The virtual game panel popped out immediately. Tapping on the world channel, the screen displayed the messages and news items one by one that were slowly flooding the screen. At this time of day, most people had already used up their trumpet counts, and the rest of them were filtered by the system. This made it easier to keep up with all the messages. L.C. As he was scrolling, he realized that there was news of the halflings. Su Mo then nodded his head and switched over to the regional channel. Halflings arrived into this world together with humans. Taking the speed of progress into account, many of them should have already encountered this strange creature, yet no one actually described its characteristics, only mentioning the need to be careful of them. In the days after the first disaster, the number of players in the regional channel had been reintegrated. Two days had passed since then, and there were still 982 people left out of the 1,000. Eighteen of them had been unlucky enough to encounter some form of danger, or unlucky circumstance, and died. As there were no speaking limits in the regional channel, there were dozens of them chattering away as if they were in a telegram group chat. Fei Ji. Brothers, I'm hungry. I'm lying on the floor of a wooden house with broken windows. My whole body is shivering. When will this end? Liang Jian. The bro above, you're so much better off than I am. I ate a pack of dried noodle snacks. I had diarrhea at night and it was so bad that I almost died from it. Liang Jian. Is there anyone who knows, can we eat what we've excreted? I don't have any grain reserves left, Na Wenqing. Liang Jian, I thought you told us that your shelter was good enough. Why does it sound so bad now? Has it gotten to the point that you have to eat your own sh asterisk t? Liang Jian. Nice one. I bet this shelter will be done for in a few days. Last time, it was mutant beasts going after the humans, and now the humans are going after them instead. How ironic. Liang Jian. I'm toughing it out for now. Once the secret realm trading opens, I'll look for Su God to trade for something. Kai Jun Fong. What have you got there? Liang Jian. Heh, it's a secret. If everyone can keep surviving, just do it. 
we're lucky to have Su God in our channel. I heard that some of the other lousy channels lost half of their members. None of them were good enough to keep everyone's spirits up. Do Fu. I'm here to introduce something. The tree bark of some bushes are edible. I ate some of it today and it tasted fine. If you can't stand the hunger, go and get some. It's better than eating dirt. Emerald. Mr. Su Mo is able to eat his fill right. Sob, sob, sob. I'm so envious of him. Lily Helen. Sigh, I'm going to flee to another shelter for help in the World Channel after I run out of food in two days. Ju Dong. The noob above, don't get fished. Lily Helen. Ha. Huh. What's fishing? Su Mo looked at the regional channel. His name had been mentioned a few times, and he could see the miscommunication caused by differences in Eastern and Western cultures. He smiled helplessly, then turned off the chat panel. If only they knew that he ate fried meat patties and biscuits with psychic energy water. The big and soft bed that he was sleeping on, covered by gentle lighting from the desk lamp at his bedside, even the cobalt he caught had psychic energy water with biscuit paste. Those people would go crazy with envy if they knew. All done. I'm going to sleep. Got to get up early tomorrow to explore the camp. Su Mo slowly fell asleep while thinking about the things he had to do the next day. He lifted his hand to switch off the desk lamp, and then the shelter turned quiet. Chapter 64 Eighth day in the wasteland, equipment upgraded you are listening at novel full dot audio. Chapter 64 Eighth day in the wasteland, equipment upgraded, doomsday calendar month 1, day 8, the vegetables you planted germinated unexpectedly. The story behind it was heartwarming, survival points plus 10, you reconstructed the shelter's design. The shelter's disaster resistance ability obtained a qualitative upgrade, survival points plus 200, you created the shelter's first high dot potential productivity tool, workbench. Survival points plus 10, first dot time handcrafting a good dot quality tool, survival points plus 10, first dot time handcrafting an excellent dot quality tool, survival points plus 50, bnoel.m, first dot time handcrafting a good dot quality material, survival points plus 10, one new member added to your shelter. You feel very happy and see hope for the future, survival points plus 10, you have obtained the first good dot quality vehicle in the Doomsday Wasteland, Survival Points plus 200, Scanning Host Survival Environment. Survival Points Evaluation in Progress. 88 points gained today. Total Calculation. Plus 588 points. Survival Points Remaining. 599 points. Yes. Awesome. My goodness. I earned almost 600 points in one go. Sure enough, going out to explore was the right way to utilize the system. When he looked at the system notifications that were sent to him at 8 in the morning, Su Mo was surprised. Before he slept last night, he was worried that he only had 11 survival points remaining. Unexpectedly, when morning came, the system gave out so many of them that it completely relieved the pressure of lacking survival points. Su Mo's mind was raced rapidly as he opened the Dead Main's personal chat channel, writing down row by row. Today's the eighth day in the wasteland. My progress has been relatively fast. Who would have thought that I would become someone who owned a vehicle in Doomsday? Ha 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 ha. No way, no way, Su Mo, you should calm down. How can you be so overwhelmed by this small reward given to you? Keep calm. Today's work is to, explore and investigate the location where the kobolds have been mining saltpeter. If there's enough time, it would be best to also locate their campsite. Attention! This might be a tough war. I must not let my guard down. Upgrade all the equipment if possible. I have to ensure my own safety. Before the sun sets at 7 o'clock, I have to return to the shelter. Remember, do not spend the night in the wilderness. I am ready. Su Mo was feeling satisfied as he switched off the chat channel. 
using the strength of his waist, he flipped his body up and landed firmly upright on the bed. It had only been one week in the wasteland and he could already feel his physical fitness had improved by more than just a single level. All his work.Related illnesses were gone thanks to the infinite supply of psychic energy water and had been instead replaced by a strong physical body. I've become much stronger than when I first arrived here. He clenched his fist and observed his visibly protruding veins as if it was proof that his blood was flowing rapidly. Su Mo had never felt so strong before. The physical body was a precious thing. If a normal person's strength was five, training a little more by lifting weights would increase it to six, but for a person to build up strength to ten would be painful, tough and require immense effort. On the other hand, the recovery process, whether it was from two to five, or even six, as long as one had sufficient nutrients and rest, the speed would be incredibly fast. Psychic energy water, it's probably the best choice that I've ever made. Su Mo stood up and gathered the psychic energy water that he collected yesterday before pouring it into the water tank. He scooped some of it and brought it to the culture medium and started to brush his teeth. Little Spark and Big Spark had already woken up and clucked away, running around in circles within the base. Oreo was doing her job. She was curled up in the corner of the living room, her eyes never leaving the cobalt mage. It was a different kind of morning at the shelter. It didn't feel as quiet or as lonely anymore, instead giving off somewhat of a happy farmhouse vibe. The food stored in the base is kind of bland and lacking in vitamins and nutrients that it won't help if I have to keep eating these in the long run. After Su Mo finished his morning routine, he went over to the warehouse, rummaging through the pile of survival goods while ruminating on his thoughts. Fresh vegetables and fruits were a luxury to even him in the wasteland. Without a regular source of nutrients, people could easily fall sick and contract an illness that even psychic energy water would not be able to cure. Perhaps a week was fine, but after two or three weeks, if the body did not absorb any nutrients, he was afraid that there would be a whole host of issues that would accompany the bodily stress inflicted, including mental problems such as easily losing one's temper. The biscuits have almost run dry as well. It has only been a few days, but I'm tired of it already. Su Mo bent down and grabbed the remaining packs of biscuits and walked out of the supply room. It was not hard to obtain fresh vegetables and fresh fruits. All he had to do was to open some treasure chests and one of them would contain those things. However, as the number of mutant beasts continued to decrease, his target could be only be the, the cobalt pack. For now though, it was the familiar biscuit paste that was for breakfast. He made four portions, enough for everyone in the base. Polishing off his breakfast, he then packed the remaining biscuit into a mineral water bottle, tightened the cap and put it back in the storage space. He then strolled toward the workbench. Since he was going to investigate the Cobalt's campsite, he would need to review and upgrade his equipment for the task. For his ranged weapon, the electric crossbow would still be sufficient for now. No upgrade would be needed at this point. Taking a look at his melee weapon, the Japanese oak spear, ceramic plate armor that would shield him, and heat-insulated raincoat, all three of those were in dire need of an upgrade. Focusing, he transferred the familiar dot-looking long spear onto the workbench. Summoning the system, Su Mo examined it. Japanese oak spear. Description. A brand dot new wooden spear with an overall fine texture. Has patterns that resemble flying swans. The material is as hard as iron and boasts impressive lethality. First upgrade option. Upgrade the material to fine iron spear, increase the hardness of the material, increase the flexibility of the material, increase the sharpness of the weapon. Survival points required, 55. Second upgrade option. Upgrade the material to fine iron spear, increase the hardness of the material, adding an electric booster that can significantly improve attacking speed. Survival points required, 80. Back then, the electric spear upgrade was too expensive for me. Now, it's a piece of cake. He looked at the price shown in the system with a smile on his face before heading to the supply room to grab some iron.
After putting in three pieces, the cost of the second upgrade option decreased to 65 points. 65 points were deducted after he made up his mind. Green, oh, give me that green color. I have more than enough cash today. Su Mo looked at the green light proudly, waving his hands as if he was the hardworking one forging the spear. The clinking sound of two metals colliding with each other echoed in the air. The Japanese oak spear began to tremble, and bits of wood were slowly shaved off from the patterned wooden spear, revealing the beautiful layer of silver under it. The wooden bits that were shaved off did not disappear. Instead, they gathered together and formed a rectangular device. The device measured 3 cm in height and 12 cm in length. Guided along by the green light, it clasped firmly underneath the wooden spear and swirled. The spearhead also evolved from its grooved wooden material to a matte, silver-dot-black colored iron edge. As the green light disappeared, a new iron spear laid on the workbench. Su Mo quickly grabbed it and held it in his hands. Fine iron electric spear, good, description. Made from special metals. Has high flexibility and toughness. The spearhead is etched with a blood groove. It boasts impressive lethality and an electric booster has been attached at the end of the spear. Special ability. Electric booster can slightly increase the attacking speed and damage. Comment. Yeah. Eat this spear. The wooden spear had been light, weighing in at about 3 kilograms. Given Su Mo's increased strength, it was no longer suitable for him. After the upgrade, the weight of the fine iron electric spear increased to 10 kilograms, which worked out perfectly for him. Su Mo stabbed out a few practice moves before trying out the electric booster button. Indeed. No electricity. The system is stingy, not even sparing me that tiny amount of electricity. He then connected the charger for the fine iron spear to the electrical supply. Su Mo then placed his well.worn raincoat on the workbench. Although it was a raincoat, it possessed a variety of functions. These days, Su Mo had been wearing it all the time, regardless of whether it was while working in the shelter or going out for a hunt. Even though he was under the hot sun, its excellent heat insulation meant that he would not feel hot. Rather, it could even insulate against the sunlight's UV rays that could possibly harm him. I shouldn't neglect my combat abilities either. It's time to upgrade myself with stronger abilities. Chapter 65 Fully Renewed, Abilities Highly Boosted You are listening at Novel Full Audio. Chapter 65 Fully Renewed, Abilities Highly Boosted Strong Raincoat, Description A raincoat with several upgrades has strong rain dot proof ability, UV ray resistance and three layers of heat insulation. First upgrade option. Improve the raincoat's material. Additional heat insulation material that increases comfortability and wind dot proof ability. Survival points required, 85. Second upgrade option. Improve the raincoat's material. Additional photometric material that increases invisibility and slightly increases wind dot proof and heat insulation ability. Survival points required, 120. These options, the first one seems to lean toward upgrading its disaster resistance, whereas the second one is perhaps, something like leveling it up to a combat uniform. Thump. Thump. Sumo tapped on the surface of the workbench with his fingers, looking at the options that the system gave him in deep thought. When he was upgrading the raincoat previously, the system gave him the option to upgrade it with an electrical device. This time, however, the electrical device option had been removed, instead being replaced with an invisibility option. If he just looked at it from the present standpoint, an upgrade in either direction was acceptable and would greatly assist him during his daily routines. However, if one had to take into account the future direction of the upgrade, then it became a much harder choice. Of course, the impending disaster was approaching, and being fully prepared for survival was essential. Otherwise, everything else would be meaningless, but if 
Su Mo did not hesitate after he had finally figured it out and said, I choose upgrade option. Number 2. 120 points were deducted after he finished his words. O.org this time, it was not the familiar green light that shone from it. Instead, it was a red light that emitted heat. The light enveloped the raincoat, and dazzling streaks of glitter and sparks started to appear on the raincoat. The raincoat transformed under the naked eye, the saggy raincoat material started to improve in texture, and the colors started to disguise themselves, seemingly melding in with the color of the workbench. What an awesome ability, the photometric invisibility effects are working even on the workbench. Photometric combat uniform, good, description. A combat uniform with outstanding abilities. It is water.proofed, has UV rays resistance, and is slightly wind.proofed, with good heat insulation. Special Abilities Photometric invisibility, from certain angles, the special material can bend light and achieve photometric invisibility. The special material has a negative refractive index and can transform optical structures. Comment If you could upgrade this, and I mean if, you might be able to open the door to a whole new world. Sumo picked up and examined the photometric combat uniform in detail before finding some clues on how it worked. As long as it was not viewed directly from the front, the photometric combat uniform provided a certain level of photometric invisibility effect, seemingly extending from a 45-degree angle to the rear of the uniform. It was his first time seeing such an effect. He had not even seen this effect on Earth before. When Su Mo tried it on himself, he could feel the difference immediately when he moved his arms and legs around. The previous raincoat fitted perfectly on him, but when moving around vigorously, he still felt his movement slightly restricted. The upgraded photometric combat uniform was like a thin film that adhered to his skin. It was as if he was wearing a 0.01mm raincoat to battle and its presence could hardly be noticed unless he was focusing on it specifically. The plastic face shield had also been upgraded to a more advanced softened rubber shell, increasing its breathability and defensive ability to a higher level. Su Mo figured that he should wear it all the time to get used to it. Finally, he took out the last piece of equipment to be upgraded, ceramic plate armor, and placed it on the workbench to take a good look at it. Hunter Ceramic Plate Armor Description Made from fine materials, has tidy outlines and an impressive defensive ability. The special aroma of hidden herb covers up the hunter's body scent. First upgrade option. Change the armor's look to a half-dot-body light armor. Slight upgrade in armor materials. Retains the ability to cover up scents and increases defensive ability. Survival points required, 105. Second upgrade option. Change the armor's look to a lower dot body light armor. Slight upgrade in armor materials. Decreases the weight of armor and increases defensive ability, survival points required, 130. Third upgrade option. Change the armor's look to a full dot body light armor. Slight upgrade in armor materials. Addition of an electrical supporting device and increased defensive ability. Survival points required. 180. Given the three options, Su Mo did not overthink and confirmed his choice of the third upgrade option. Electrical energy was a productive resource. No matter what type of electrical device it was, it could transform that resource into kinetic energy. Currently, the cheapest and most convenient resource for this was electrical energy. With the electrical device, he would turn into someone who could perform magic feats in the eyes of people who were clueless about science. Without the electrical device, even if the armor was upgraded to the extent where it could slice off iron easily, or even became unusually strong and solid, it could still only be considered as a stronger tool for taking hits and defense. While it was risky to only depend on a person's strength to fight and battle in the doomsday wasteland, Su Mo knew which was more important to him. He tried to pour in the materials he had on hand and, after adding in two pieces of iron, the upgrade cost dropped to 165. He suppressed the impulse to save on survival points and he gritted his teeth as he confirmed the third upgrade option. 
the ceramic plate armor that had been through life and death with Su Mo had accomplished its mission. The next second, under the green light's tremendous power, it melted into a puddle of black liquid. The green light was like a pair of unseen hands, starting to knead the liquid into shape out of nowhere. The puddle of liquid soon started to form and take shape, aligning itself with the size and shape of Su Mo's body. The green light disappeared after three to five seconds. Bang! The finished armor fell onto the workbench and let out a cry. A full dot body suit of armor, complete with pauldrons, a pair of H and a rather stupid dot looking armor helmet. Let's forget about the helmet, even if I wear it, I would still die if someone shot me in the head. Su Mo examined the sophisticated pattern on the helmet and checked to see if the electrical device was situated behind the helmet before putting it back into the equipment warehouse. Even if he wore the photometric combat uniform, the huge helmet would stand out. Wearing it was equivalent to running the risk of getting himself caught by enemies. The upper and lower body armor pieces seem light enough. Wearing them shouldn't affect my movements. The light armor weighed around 10 kilograms and could offer enough protection while not affecting his movement and dodging speed in battle. Su Mo nodded as he pondered on the weight of both light armor pieces. Looks like the electrical device was hidden in the boots, Su Mo followed the light and examined the light armor boots on the workbench. Two long devices extended from the front to the back of the boots, but he could not find the battery's location, and neither could it be seen from the outside. Su Mo searched the boots for a while before finally spotting the charging port on the heel of the boots. He also found the activation switch on the toe of the boots. While its inability to automatically danger and activate could be its largest defect of this electrical device, at least the activation mechanism is convenient enough. All I have to do is point and press my toe to the ground to start the device. He grabbed the boots and left them on the floor to charge from the electrical supply. Su Mo then started to prepare the final piece of the puzzle. Customized Crossbow Arrows His current crossbow arrows had been created by the game itself and were sufficient to take on normal kobolds, but this time he was heading into enemy territory. There was no guarantee that he would not encounter stronger enemies. As such, Su Mo was planning to create the crossbow arrows that were completely different from the average crossbow arrow, improving their lethality. He headed back to the energy distribution room and plugged in the generator to the before switching on the workbench's power button. He took a piece of iron and placed it on the bench before Su Mo closed his eyes. After 10 minutes, Su Mo opened his eyes and concentrated on the material in front of him. The robotic arm on the workbench detected his approaching arm and automatically encased it, becoming one with the arm. Su Mo switched the left dot hand arm to its high dot speed cutter mode and sliced the iron into ten even, small rectangular pieces that each measured 18 centimeters in length. The crossbow arrow that the system had created was of average length, about 25 centimeters, and possessed both lethality and speed. However, the arrows being of uniform length also meant that they had no special attributes to speak of. This time, Su Mo was thinking outside the box. He altered the length of the shaft and started to modify it with determination. According to the system's crossbow arrow design, Su Mo's attention was focused on cutting and grinding, making sure that the width of the broadheads and the fletchings were equivalent. When wearing the robotic arm, the steadiness of the arm allowed Su Mo to ensure that the accurate requirements of the crafting process would be executed perfectly. Little sparks ignited and scattered around, hitting the stone wall. Su Mo was extremely focused during the production process, and his efficiency was quite impressive too. Only three minutes were needed to produce a crossbow arrow and it left aside to cool down. After finishing ten of them, Su Mo's back was soaked with sweat. This type of labor-intensive activity required high levels of concentration. A slight mistake would lead to the crossbow arrow being wasted and having to be rebuilt from scratch. It was thanks to the excellent quality level of the workbench, which increased concentration levels, that 10 of the crossbow arrows were successfully produced. Chapter 66 Getting ready, to the saltpeter mine you are listening at novelfull.audio
Chapter 66 Getting ready, to the saltpeter mine Su Mo stared at the arrow case that contained the ten crossbow arrows. They were neatly aligned, their broad heads facing upward. Even though there was a slight metallic smell lingering in the air, Su Mo paid it no mind. It was his first time forging something requiring that much precision and the success of the endeavor filled him with a sense of accomplishment. Su Mo focused mentally again, and the attributes that were displayed by the system panel took his level of satisfaction to the next level, his heart almost bursting with happiness. Dot, high, speed crossbow arrow, excellent X3, good X7, description. Customized, crossbow arrow made by the quasi-elementary level craftsman, Su Mo. Forged using regular methods, but was upgraded to good quality for inexplicable reasons. Special ability. Excellent. Super. Fast flying, silent. Good. Super. Fast flying comment. From beginner to elementary level, such a transformation. Yes. I'm already considered a quasi. Elementary level manufacturer now. Looks like the effects of the excellent. Quality workbench's enhancement cannot not be taken lightly. The attributes of the new crossbow arrows certainly did not waste its quality enhancement. Even though the overall enhancement given by the workbench was only a modest 10%, when it came to actual use, it was of great help in maintaining the craftsman's concentration level. Ten crossbow arrows, three of them were excellent dot quality level and the other seven were good dot quality. Although he had yet to test them out, Su Mo instinctively knew that, from the attributes enhancement, the ones that he created were much better than those made by the system. Su Mo stood up and adjusted his posture, moving his neck left and right to relieve some of the stiffness. With a wave of his hand, Su Mo triggered the system and stored the new crossbow arrows into the storage space neatly. Then he turned his gaze toward the charging ports and stared at the crossbow, long spear and combat boots on the floor. Strong emotions emerged from the depths of Su Mo's heart. Armed with these equipment, he would dare to fight against more than ten kobolds. Even though the kobolds' campsite might be deathly and perilous, he still had to go. Time passed as he patiently waited for the equipment to be fully charged. In a blink of an eye, it was already noon. Three of the equipment batteries were fully charged, the indicators flashing green. Su Mo took out the baguette that he had traded for earlier and put all two kilograms of it into the pot to make a bread soup. He took one dot fifth of the soup and poured it into Little Spark and Big Spark's food bowl. He scooped out another half and poured it into Oreo's food bowl. Su Mo grabbed the rest of the bread soup after waiting for it to cool and chugged it down in one go. After filling his stomach and getting enough rest, he was once again back to his best condition, raring to go. Su Mo came to the weapon armament storage and began to equip himself one by one. First was light armor. The light armor was designed like the silver lamellar armor worn during the uprising of the Red Turban Rebellion. He had to start with the cuirass. Su Mo held the armor with his hands outstretched between the holes, and tucked his head in like when wearing a sweater. The customized cuirass which was made of special steel that aligned perfectly with the body's curved shape. Also, because it was made with modern methods and materials, the ultra-lightweight armor felt equivalent to wearing a down jacket on a winter's day. The lower part of the armor were the folds that hooked onto the upper body armor, and it had a belt to secure it from falling off. After he finished wearing the upper and lower parts of the armor, he picked up the pauldrons and wore them on both shoulders and arms, before securing them. The size of the combat boots was based on Sumo's feet. They were professionally designed and he could put them on easily. Oddly enough, they felt more comfortable than wearing a conventional pair of sneakers. It's true that armor boosts one's courage. Sumo's body structure tended toward a more lean shape due to his previous lack of exercise but, after he put on his armor, he mysteriously felt stronger. He could not help but start visualizing a battle between a kobold and himself, outfitted in this armor suit. He then raised a leg and pressed his toes on the ground, resulting in a clink-clank activation sound. 
Su Mo proceeded by trying to take a few steps forward. Ha! Huh. Does the effect not apply to walking? The electrical boots did not seem to detect his movements, so Su Mo switched to running instead. The next second, a strong force came streaming out from his heels. That moment, Su Mo felt as if he was being propelled so far forward that he almost fell over. That was really fast. Tell me now, who would be able to withstand this speed? Su Mo's happiness was getting obvious as stretched his legs and ran several rounds in circles. Oreo, who was still licking her food bowl, was dumbstruck, her jaw dropped while looking at Su Mo running around at that speed in the shelter. The electrical boots did not just boost his running motions. As the speed went higher, Su Mo tried performing different stunts and they all showed a significant speed boost. Bang! He pressed his toes on the ground and ran two more steps before the speed boost effect disappeared. What an improvement! If I had been wearing these back at the ruins, the cobalt mage wouldn't have had the time to launch that fireball. Su Mo had already been surprised by the light armor. He was even more excited about the fine iron electric spear. However, before that, Su Mo wore the photometric combat uniform over the armor. As he was wearing armor, the photometric combat uniform had to stretch larger to cover it. Nevertheless, the material had a strong flexibility and extensibility rating. The perfectly dot-fitted combat uniform played its part by adhering firmly onto the armor. He grabbed the fully dot-charged fine iron electric spear and switched it on. The fine iron electric spear buzzed momentarily then returned to normal. He tried his hand at some practice moves, stabbing and sweeping forward, and noticed that there it emitted a secondary force, making the electric spear move even faster. When he switched it off, the enhancement disappeared. Su Mo eyed his set of brand new equipment happily, extremely proud of himself. Stowing away the fine iron electric spear and electric crossbow into the storage space, he walked over to the corner and grabbed the cobalt. The cobalt, who was still asleep, awoke in shock. At first, he lifted his head in panic, but upon realizing that it was just Su Mo, he ignored Su Mo and continued his decadent behavior. It had been two days and Su Mo still did not seem to have the intention to recruit him. The cobalt had already discarded his imaginations and began to face reality. Woof, woof. Oreo was excited seeing Su Mo grab the cobalt as she watched from the side. Let's go. Tell him to lead the way. If he lies or leads us in the wrong direction, today will be the last day of his miserable life. Su Mo carried the thin and weak cobalt in his hands as he moved toward the shelter's entrance. Since Oreo heard that they were going out for fun, she barked loudly, communicating with the cobalt. After confirming the message with him, Oreo barked twice, hinting that she was done communicating. Once everything was prepared, the shelter's entrance opened and Su Mo closed the door carefully after taking a glance at the facilities within. He moved and passed through the entrance hallway to the outside. When there was no disaster, the wasteland sun was always blazing brightly during the day, and yellow sand was scattered all around. Sometimes, one or two vultures flew across, making grunting noises. Su Mo threw the cobalt to the ground and went back into the other side of the shelter's entrance, placing the door bar at an angle, before turning around and forcefully shutting the shelter doors a deep sound groaned when Su Mo tried to push against the door. The door bar had been dropped and set, blocking out any potential forces that might come from the outside. He gave it a few more tries to see if it was possible to open the door from the outside. Failing successfully, Su Mo nodded and walked over to the entrance of the garage. He lifted the wooden boards that covered the simple and crude garage, revealing the buggy sitting quietly in the spot where Se Mo had left it. He gave it a once-over before climbing inside and starting the engine. He drove the buggy to the entrance of the shelter. Woof! The cobalt lying on the ground was astonished when he saw the buggy, looking at it in disbelief, unable to understand why an iron box would be moving about. Oreo looked at cobalt as if it were a hillbilly. The way she scoffed at it was epic. Oreo, please bear with me. 
you're going to sit with me today. Su Mo put the kobold on the rear compartment and buckled him up. He then bent his body, grabbed Oreo in his arms, and returned to the front seat of his buggy. Oreo was more than willing when she heard what Su Mo said. Oreo buried her head bashfully into Su Mo's photometric combat uniform, lying on his lap, motionless. After checking everything once again, he engaged the gear lever and looked back at the shelter, a little unwilling to leave. Let's go. Our next destination is the Cobalt Saltpeter Mine. Su Mo shouted, sweeping away his reluctance to leave, and stepped on the accelerator. The buggy was like an arrow leaving its bowstring, shooting forward forcefully. The deep humming noise from the engine resonated alongside the strong winds of sandstorm as he headed west on the deserted wasteland. Chapter 67 Initial Exploration Spectacular Saltpeter Mine You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Chapter 67 Initial Exploration Spectacular Saltpeter Mine Hourly Speed 45, Hourly Speed 62, Hourly Speed 23, the journey to the Cobalt Saltpeter Mine collection location was not smooth sailing. They stumbled over rocks throughout the journey, and that made them unable to increase their speed. Despite having traveled almost 40 to 50 minutes, Su Mo had only covered less than 30 kilometers. The kobold behind him had obviously never seen such a speedy artifact before and spent the entire journey lost in their imagination. No one knew what it was thinking. When the kobold noticed the car slowing down, it immediately understood and continued pointing out directions. Oh, looks like the kobold camp and saltpeter mine are on the west side. The car continued going forth in the direction the kobold had pointed in. After traveling for another twenty or so kilometers, it surmounted a high slope that obstructed their view. When Su Mo noticed the kobold gesturing, he instinctively raised his head to look toward where the kobold's finger was pointing. His pupils contracted immediately. On the distant ground was a sheet of ice crystals that looked like silk as it lay atop a mountaintop that stretched for miles. There were still around ten kilometers left before they arrived at the saltpeter mine. Su Mo could already tell that this area was a massive, natural saltpeter vein. Without a doubt, it would feel even more eerily stunning when they got nearer and stood below the mineral veins. How is this saltpeter mine so massive? How on earth did it form? Su Mo had an expression of surprise on his face as he hurriedly got out of his car and retrieved his binocular that had a 5x zoom from his storage space to begin sizing up the saltpeter mine. With the help of the binoculars, the full view of the saltpeter mine began growing clearer. No need to feel panic when you have a mine at your disposal. Gustav II Adolf, who was otherwise known as the Lion of the North back in the day, had led the Protestant alliance to multiple victories against the Catholic armies thanks to the utilization of his firearms and saltpeter mines back in his old home of Sweden. However, many European countries did not produce saltpeter, which made the source of these ores a big, constant problem. It was all right during peaceful times, but the minute war broke out, it would be a big problem if their business supply was cut off. King Charles I of England had been plagued by the problem of gunpowder while he was at war with opposition forces both at home and abroad. Thus, the King of England himself had no choice but to turn his attention to a stinking, filthy place, pit latrines. To ensure the production of gunpowder, the king had specially appointed officials to dig up the topsoil, which contained nitrites, from the latrines and stables on his territory. He extracted the nitrates from the soil and even issued an order that forbade any latrines or stables in the country from having stone slabs or wood slabs laid on the ground so that it would not affect the collection of soil. Cobblers, who were large users of nitrate, lost their source of income. Every respectable clergy in churches then were bestowed with an honorable task, which was to rally the city folk who attended prayer sessions to come forth and pee collectively. From that moment onwards, peeing was no longer an awkward, filthy thing to do. Instead, they were playing their part to contribute toward the country. Among these, the church's chairs were particularly valued. 
One was not allowed to leave and use the restroom halfway through prayers, but nature's call was difficult to ignore. Thus, the church's chairs were so battered and bruised that one could scrape off high. Quality saltpeter off of these chairs. At that time, England folk thought that women's urine contained particularly high amounts of saltpeter. They even began chanting the slogan, Please contribute your share for your husband fighting on the front lines. Yet, now. Sue M.O. stared at the giant saltpeter mine in front of him. He could not for the life of him imagine any reason that would cause the birth of such a huge vein. If you told me that this massive vein was formed because some monster peed from the sky, I would have believed you. However, the kobolds must view saltpeter mines as something extremely important. I can't believe that there are at least a hundred kobolds who have set up camp here, huh? That is. Human. With the help of the binoculars, Su Mo could clearly see an upright creature that looked completely different from the kobolds. Ten kilometers was still too far away. The image created by the binoculars with 5x zoom caused a shadow to cast over Su Mo's heart. Su Mo returned to the buggy, pulled up Oreo, who was still busy sniffing the ground, relit the fire, and set out again. This time, he was going to risk traveling another five kilometers forward. The buggy did not travel quickly, but it managed to arrive at the location Su Mo wanted it to after an estimated ten minutes had elapsed. This time, even without using the help of binoculars, Su Mo could clearly see a large expanse of houses that seemed to be built from wood in the distance. Even more, Su Mo even noticed a house constructed using the base of a safe house built next to these houses. After getting out of the car, retrieving the binoculars, and looking at the image formed by the binoculars again, Su Mo's hands curled into fists. Dozens of people were hard at work mining on the rolling expanse of mines. However, these people were not kobolds. Instead, they were humans. Kobold warriors were scattered around the veins. Su Mo counted under his breath to get a rough estimate. Right now, there were no less than 200 kobold warriors in his line of sight. And the most terrifying part was that there were at least 50 kobold warriors who were sitting and having fun in the middle of the campgrounds. These were just the ones in his direct line of sight. He was afraid that after accounting for those he had not seen, there would be more than 300 kobolds in this particular saltpeter mine camp. 300 kobolds monitoring a dozen people while they mined. As Su Mo gazed into the binoculars, he came into a realization. I thought everyone else nearby the area I was deposited had been taken care of by Huang Biao. Now, it looks like the remaining humans have all been captured to the mines by the kobolds. Luckily, my shelter is a full 60 kilometers away from this place. If not, I would have met strange creatures like these on my first two days. No wonder the Huaxia shelter was so secretive about matters concerning foreign civilizations. It's probably because there have been countless humans who have already been enslaved by these monsters. But have their chat channels been restricted? If not, why have I not seen any messages regarding this on the world channel? Su Mo speculated to himself as he made observations. There were so many kobolds. He looked at the gear he had on. Unless he was given a Gatling gun and a limitless supply of bullets. Only then could he try attacking the base and saving the humans. At the very least, with the gear he had on now, it would not be a simple feat to launch an attack on that base. Who would have expected this saltpeter mine, to be this tricky? I'm afraid that the number of monsters inside this kobold camp will be larger than the ones I have here. Up to a thousand kobolds. Once he thought of the fact he had neighbors as enthusiastic as he was by his side, and that they would invite you to go mining at their house once they met you, a line immediately appeared above Su Mo's head. Sense of security point 10,000. No, I must go and scout out the situation inside the kobold camp. Su Mo had a solemn expression on his face as he turned and returned to the buggy. Oreo hurriedly jumped in after him. Oreo, let him lead the way. We're going to their camp. The minute he finished speaking, Oreo began communicating with the kobold. 
A minute later, the buggy left a trail of dust behind it as it began traveling toward the direction of the northern side of the saltpeter mine. The terrain near the saltpeter mine was all steeped and had high slopes. Although the speed could not be picked up, the saltpeter mines and cobalt camp were not too far away if the distance was measured using the buggy's speed. When he heard the cobalt signal that they were almost there, Sue Mo parked the buggy underneath the shadows of some shrubbery, dragged the cobalt off the seats, and held it in his arms as they walked forth. After walking for around five or six hundred meters and climbing over another tall hill, Sue Mo finally caught sight of the cobalt camp. This, can this be called a cobalt camp? Perhaps it should be called a castle. It would be more suitable, right? Su Mo's eyes filled with astonishment as he stood on the hill and looked down at the massive area in front of him. If the saltpeter mine could be described as one of nature's miracles. Dot then the cobalt castle in front of him was definitely a sign of unparalleled architectural greatness. By the looks of it, the diameter of the castle in front of him was more than 500 meters. There were round towers, narrow windows, semi-dot circular arches, low domes, and layered door frames. It all looked stunningly beautiful. In terms of its style, large quantities of columns and domes of various shapes had been used to achieve the aesthetic effect of solidity and heaviness, balance and stability, and saturation of strength. The narrow windows and the massive space within formed a stark contrast. It caused the castle's interior to be dimly lit and looked as if it had never dot ending corridors, giving people an air of mystique. For sharp turrets were atop the four corners of the castle. Su Mo used the binoculars and saw that there were kobolds in charge of making patrols inside the tower. When he looked downwards, besides the mages and warriors, Su Mo's sharp eyes spotted a kobold wearing a long white robe. This is the third type of kobold. I wonder what is special about this cobalt, the cobalt stature could not be considered as upright, but as it stepped up onto the city walls, the four or five cobalt mages behind it followed it respectfully. The city walls were not long. The white dot robed cobalt did not stop in its footsteps as it spoke. Soon, they all vanished from the end of the city walls. However, Su Mo did not have time to continue investigating when one of the small doors on the Cobalt Mansion opened abruptly. A group of Cobalts walked out, and it was obvious they were walking toward Su Mo. Oh no! Have they seen me? Chapter 68 Villalan, the beginning of trust collapsing you are listening at novelfull.audio Chapter 68 Villalan, the beginning of trust collapsing there was only one walled city gate on the castle's front side. Because these doors were in a pair, they seemed exceptionally thick and heavy to operate. There was another smaller door beside the larger ones for easy access. The small door was pushed open, and an army of kobolds walked out. Different from exploration teams, this team was formed of twelve kobolds, namely six warriors in the front, three mages in the middle, and then another three warriors at the back. Su Mo used his binoculars to look at the kobolds and determine their motives through the look in their eyes. They were walking in his direction. However, the kobold squad was not marching forth at a particularly fast speed. They did not seem to be chasing after something but instead looked like they were going to take care of another matter somewhere else. Is this team going to the saltpeter mines? He made some guesses, and then looked at how there were around a thousand meters left between them. Su Mo turned around and summoned his fine iron electronic spear from the storage space. Turning around to look at his captive cobalt, Su Mo did not say another word as he deftly raised his spear and brought it down in a stab. Although this spear did not have any electronic assistance, the amount of strength Su Mo wielded was beginning to get scary. He managed to crack open his captive's skull. When Su Mo noticed that both red and white substances would spill out and remain on the ground if he pulled out the tip of his spear, Su Mo got an idea and stored the corpse in the burial bucket he had crafted and stored in his storage space. One had to be ruthless when the time called for it while they were out battling for survival. Since the kobold's mission had been accomplished, there was no need for any more nonsense. 
sending him back to the arms of the kobold's ancestors was the biggest mercy he could show. This gang cannot be killed for now. I'll follow them from the back and see what they're up to. The group was formed from twelve kobolds in total. Perhaps it might have been a problem if he continued hiding in the kobold saltpeter mine camp or keeping a watch on the kobold castle. However, Su Mo had full confidence that he would be able to destroy all the kobolds in one go once they were in the wild. After making several more observations, he noticed that the kobold team had not changed the direction they were traveling in even after another 500 meters. Su Mo squashed his thoughts and bent double to quickly retreat along the flanks. Oreo, who was beside Su Mo, immediately understood what he was doing and ran alongside Su Mo in the wilderness. Both human and dog had nothing to look back on as they came and went without showing even a shadow. Su Mo sprawled on the grassy field nearby with Oreo and watched coldly as the kobold team walked right past without noticing he was sprawled out there. The kobold team's formation had become extremely loose during their journey. Even more, the two kobold mages in the center who were closer to the back than they were to the front were whispering to each other. No one knew what they were talking about, but from time to time, they laughed loudly and threw their heads back to howl, a perfect display of happiness. Oreo, circle over to the front later and see if any kobolds are waiting to welcome them. If there are, hurry back and tell me. I'll be following them from the back. Su Mo reached a combat.uniform.clad handout and patted Oreo's round head as he gave his orders in a low voice. Oreo, who understood the human language, nodded and growled in a deep voice before dashing toward the front. Compared to the slow, Marching kobolds, Oreo, who used all four limbs to travel, moved astonishingly quickly. It only took her the time of five or six breaths before she caught up to the kobold team and surpassed them through the sides to appear ahead of them. All right. Su Mo stood and hurried over to the tall hill. After ensuring that there was no second team coming from the kobold castle, he jogged to catch up to them. From the saltpeter mine camp to the kobold castle, the two places were not too far away if you used a buggy to measure the distance. However, on foot, it took more than an hour before Su Mo returned to the saltpeter mine camp along with the kobold team. Some distance away, at an area that spanned less than 500 meters, was a temporary defense camp that the kobolds had set up. Several massive, sharpened wooden spikes were placed horizontally at the camp's entrance. Wooden barbs were stuck onto the fence surrounding the campgrounds in a pattern that would cause a tripophobia attack. Dot two scout towers that seemed around 10 meters tall were erected on both sides of the camp so that they could be used to scout out the surrounding terrain. When Su Mo saw the layout, not only did he not feel confused, but a feeling of familiarity appeared within him. If I hadn't seen these kobolds, I'm afraid I would have thought this was a shelter camp built by humans. Su Mo laughed at himself as he took out his binoculars and looked toward the Saltpeter Mountain Mine. Around two hours had passed since he had first observed these miners and then took a round trip. However, the humans at the mines were still being forced to work hard and mine under the blazing sun. Now that they were closing in, Su Mo could even see in greater detail the expression of numbed pain on the miners' faces through his binoculars. He could see the entirety of the mountain when he stood on the hill and noticed there were more than fifty miners present. Now, sprawled on the side of the camp, he could only see one side of the mountain. Those that I can see clearly in my current line of sight, there are twelve Asians, seventeen blacks, and six whites. Ha! Huh. Why don't those two need to mine? An astonished expression appeared on Su Mo's face as he gazed through his binoculars. The rest of the people in his line of sight were hard at work mining. Sweat streaked down their faces and washed off the dirt, forming clearly visible marks. However, amidst these miners were two people holding wooden spears. They walked in and back again, not seeming the slightest bit like a miner. Su Mo put down his binoculars and rubbed his eyes, which were starting to become sore after an extended period of focus. Once they had adequate rest, Su Mo looked over again. One Asian, and one white, these are supervisors. 
hierarchy existed wherever humans were, even if they had become the cobalt servants. It was natural that two so dot called supervisors had come to exist. Yet, Su Mo's blood boiled when he moved the binoculars the next second. He could see a man who looked like an islander at the large houses in the center of the camp, sitting in front of the kobolds and laughing as he talked to them. The three kobold mages who had come over from the castle were now sitting in front of the man, gesturing with their hands as they talked about things he could not hear. D asterisk a minute. This asterisk shoal has better meals than I do and lives more comfortably than I do. Who knows how many people he must have oppressed to do so. Other people were mining and seeding. Yet, the man in the house was sitting in front of a grill and turning it with reckless abandon as he scattered what seemed like seasonings on top of it from time to time. Even if he could not smell the scent that emaciated from the grill as the spices were scattered atop the meat. Su Mo could still imagine the scent from his memories back on earth. The minutes and seconds ticked by. Su Mo kept staring until the man finished grilling the meat, divided it into portions using a knife, and placed the separate portions into the cobalt's bowls. When everyone finished eating, they walked out of the wooden house and conversed in the middle of the camp. During this process, Su Mo did not feel any emotions, although Oreo seemed slightly agitated. D asterisk a minute. I was wondering why that person seemed somewhat familiar. Finally, he managed to use his binoculars and look at the man in the center of the camp. The one who had betrayed humans and whose face was now synonymous with the word villain. At the same time, it triggered a portion of Su Mo's memories. If I recall correctly, this asterisk show must be named. Kento Maeda. I think I've seen this person talk in the World Channel after the first update. Bits and pieces of Su Mo's memories began appearing as Su Mo tried his best to locate them. That person seemed to have been looking to form a team with a group of kind-hearted people with good morals so that they could take care of each other. Who would have thought that it was your standard example of fishing? The wasteland had always been a dangerous place. And now, the occupation of villain had made a sudden appearance. Suddenly, Su Mo felt that all sorts of malice could be found in the game's chat panel if someone used it with that intention. Perhaps in the start, the chat channel was a useful tool for everyone to use in communicating. However, as time passed, it became harder to assess every person who spoke in the chat panel and ponder the goodness or badness of their character, and whether there were any malicious meanings hidden within. When that happened, a person's credibility would collapse, and everyone would not be familiar with anyone else. Except for official shelters, all privately dot built shelters would be filled with schemes and tricks. The lone wolves left behind would have to spend their time during doomsday alone. Perhaps the fact that Magoo is unwilling to go looking for friends even after spending 19 disasters alone is a realistic portrayal of the collapse of trust amidst humans. The more Su Mo thought about it, the more he felt the intent to kill racing in him as he stared at Kento Maeda, who had not even wiped the oil from the corners of his mouth. This man could not be allowed to remain here. Chapter 69 Choice I want it all. You are listening at NovelFull.audio Chapter 69 Choice I want it all. The two parties at the center of the camp were still continued on, clumsily. Because they did not have a professional translator like Oreo, both Kento and the Kobolds could not understand what the other party meant with full accuracy. They had to resort to using primitive gestures and make the simplest of communications. As Su Mo looked on, he slowly understood what their conversation meant. Kento was probably laying out a plan for the Kobolds. He used his fingers to mimic a helicopter's rotor and seemed close to putting it on his head and flying into the air. Yet, the stupid kobolds seemed unable to understand the meaning behind it. They woofed twice anxiously when they realized they did not understand a large amount of the gestures made. After around half an hour, when even Su Mo had gotten tired of watching, the two parties finally finished communicating. Kento waved his large hand and hollered several times to a few henchmen. A small car was pushed out from a warehouse some distance away. Ha! Huh. 
This is saltpeter that has already been collected. The saltpeter was white dot colored with streaks of brown in it. Su Mo could tell it had high levels of purity even by looking at it through his binoculars. Compared to nitrates found in feces and urine, saltpeter like this was an essential resource to compete for back when munitions first began setting up business. The cobalt seemed to treat Kento as an equal. However, the two henchmen did not seem to be so lucky. Several kobolds could be seen shouting and yelling at the henchmen even from a distance away, a haughty expression on their faces. Yet, the henchmen could only suffer quietly as they did not dare to show their anger. If a human ends up like this, they might as well have lost any shred of dignity they ever had. They're drifting through their days and taking each day as it comes. After Su Mo calmed down the urge to kill in his heart, he got up slowly and began retreating. He had a rough idea of how the plot was going to progress. It was most likely that the Cobalt team that had arrived just now was here to transport this shipment of mined saltpeter back to the castle. Looks like the Cobalt leader is no idiot too if he knows that the outside camps should not have massive gunpowder killing machines in their camps outside. Doing so would be giving the kobolds here the ability to support their troops, and they would lose what authority they had. Shame. What a shame. I'm afraid this group of kobolds is going to ship their saltpeter over to me, Su Mo. Su Mo barked out a cold laugh. When the distance between them was far enough, he stood up deftly and did not turn to look back as he ran towards the road the kobolds had taken to come here. Only little children made decisions. I want everything. This time, the saltpeter will belong to me, and the kobold's lives will also belong to me. Move it, everyone. If not, I won't be able to save your doggish lives if Lord Doug begins throwing blame around. As Kento watched the kobold team drive off with a truck full of mined saltpeter, he wiped the sweat off his forehead and spoke to the henchman by his feet in an arrogant and boastful voice. When the in.game clan translation function was used, one could easily understand what the other person said as long as they were of the human race. Yes, Lord Maeda. The two henchmen hurriedly stood at attention and bowed a 90.degree bow to Kento. Ha! A satisfied expression appeared on Kento's face when he looked at the two people by him, and he continued speaking. Ah, Ing Xiong, I asked you to recruit more people using the game panel. How are you doing? Any progress lately, when Ying Xiong, who was standing on the left, heard that, he immediately began shuddering as he braced himself and said. Lord Kento, we have fished nearly everyone in the nearby surroundings. Furthermore, many people are already becoming suspicious because those two dogs leaked out information on purpose. We, idiot. When Kento heard what Ying Xiong said, a violent look crossed his face as he kicked Ying Xiong in the chest with all his strength. How many times have I told you to not call them dogs here but to call them kobold lords instead? Are you a pig? Can't you understand the human language? If there's a next time, I'll make sure you travel to hell and meet those two people from the day before. Ying Xiong had been kicked to the ground, and he had an expression of pain as he hurriedly nodded. B. Size droplets of sweat rolled from his forehead, but he pursed his lips tightly and did not dare voice out his pain. When Kento saw the state Ing Xiong was in, he nodded and said to the other person, Marshal, you'll come with me. Then, Kento turned and walked straight toward one of the rooms in the back. The person named Marshal had a numb expression on their face as they followed along. In the pitch. Black room, the only light came from a small window about the size of a human's head. As he stood in the dark, Marshall could not tell what expression was on Kento's face, who was sitting in front of a table. A split second later. I asked you to make a private collection. Um, how is it going, it's... It's done. I didn't dare hide away too much and only stole small quantities when the mages were asleep. I've almost amassed a kilogram. All right. The sound of Kento's almost unhittable excitement rang out from the pitch. Black room. How about the other task I gave you, to scout out the location of Sumo's base, going, when Marshall heard Kento say that, 
he sounded almost ready to cry as he said, Lord Maeda, amidst the many kobolds I purposely sent toward Sumo's shelter the other day, only two exploration teams remain. More than a day has passed, but there still isn't any message, I'm afraid, huh? My brothers are too scared to go. Su Mo is a vicious and merciless person who kills people like he's cutting grass. The shelter is so safe. There's nothing we can do even if we go there. Kento first had an agonized expression on his face when he heard what Marshall had to say but then he began laughing creepily as if everything was going according to plan. This laughter sounded extraordinarily ominous. Even though the sun was blazing from the sky, and the weather was scorching, Marshall felt as if he had fallen straight into an ice cellar. B asteriskal shit. Did you think I asked you to hide those things so we could look at them? I've already received the news, ha ha ha, as long as you place it in a suitable place, you won't have to lift a finger before he cracks open the shell which he thinks is so strong. When the time comes around, let's not think of the fact he seems made of stone. As long as you do as I say, even if it's made of reinforced concrete and is the Sodot called best shelter in the world, it will still be a fancy grave, when the time comes and we can go in to get his shelter core, ha ha ha, once I get that secret, do you think the kobolds will have any authority to stand and speak loudly to me? Kento would not let anyone else call them kobolds, but he did so himself without abandon. A look of disgust instinctively appeared on Marshall's face when he heard those casual insults, but the expression on his face became serious the very next second. That's right, Marshall. How's the mission where I asked you to go scout around in the Cobalt Castle? Kento laughed recklessly as he stood up from the table and utilized the light shining in to make his way over to the small bed, sit down, and look out the window. Cobalts did not understand human language. Kento had the resources and confidence to believe that no kobolds would overhear and expose them even if they discussed such topics in such recklessness here. We've been to the kobold castle thrice but have only managed to get up to the third floor every time. We weren't able to enter the fourth and fifth floors. I suspect that's where they store their gunpowder. Or perhaps, they have some unspeakable secrets hidden there. When Marshall finished speaking, he respectfully pulled out a piece of rolled dot up yellow paper from his coat and handed it over, respectfully. Fourth floor, fifth floor, looks like there's a huge secret in this kobold castle too, as Kento gazed at the complete distribution of kobolds on the first, second, and third floor as well as the locations where the kobolds stashed their goods in the kobold castle, he nodded and allowed a creepy smile to form on his face as he said. Marshall, you're very good. But remember to be smarter the next time you go over and serve the kobolds. Find a opening to look at what is on the fourth and fifth floor. But remember. Before we get Sumo's secret, we must be careful and meticulous. Don't let anyone catch wind of this. That's right. And make sure to never let these stupid dogs know anything about Sumo. I'll think of a plan for the two missing exploration teams. You will be my most trusted general when we take over the Cobalt Castle. You and I will establish order in the new world. When the time comes, beauty, wealth, safety, all this will be at your disposal. As Kento finished speaking, he turned to face the light and laughed recklessly as he hugged the map to his chest. He seemed to have already begun imagining the wonderful days of the future. The expressions on Marshall's face changed rapidly in the dark. From anger to recklessness. From recklessness to calmness. Finally, it changed from calm to a cold, imperceptible smile as he clutched his curled fists. Marshall said in an obedient voice. Yes, sir, Lord Maeda. I will not betray your trust. The new world will belong to us. Chapter 70 Eliminate and Destroy All Foreigners you are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Chapter 70 Eliminate and Destroy All Foreigners. It was undeniable. Back during the Age of Civilization, Huaxia's Gaokao was tortuous. However, if you attended the Gaokao again after knowing all the answers, that happy feeling of knowing everything was within your control would definitely make someone faint from happiness. Are they here? Waf. 
Su Mo sprawled on the elevated portion of a gentle slope and patted Oreo, who was still panting after having run over. Su Mo could not stop his heart from racing when he saw Oreo nod obediently. In Su Mo's line of sight, messy grass spread across a patch of scorched yellow soil some 60 meters in front of him. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. However, as he watched the kobolds come closer and closer without changing their route, a smile tugged on the corner of Su Mo's lips. Dogs, even if they've evolved into humans, they still adhere to their old habits in some ways, the path the kobolds had taken when they arrived and now when they were returning. If you took a closer look at the footprints, you would notice that these messy footprints were actually traveling across a predetermined pathway. Even more, after multiple times of travel, the grass here had slowly been trampled to death, and it was slowly evolving to become a road. Su Mo had a sudden whim when he hurried over from the saltpeter mine and observed that these animals had not changed their route after so many times. He hurriedly dug out a trap in the middle of the path where he wanted to ambush them. The kobolds weighed so little it was almost pitiful, which meant the trap would not collapse if they stepped on it. However, if they walked over it with the cartload of saltpeter, he was a hundred percent sure they would fall. Then, the kobolds would have to think of a way to pull the car back up. Of course, as they thought, they would find themselves brainstorming in the underworld. Don't change, don't change. Yes, yes, yes. Walk over it just like that. Well done, dot boom. As Su Mo muttered quietly, for kobolds were pulling at the front while two other kobolds pushed from the back. They had just walked over the trap when the cart fell into it with a boom. One of the kobolds who had been pushing from the back used too much strength and ended up falling in as well. It barked out in pain. Woof woof hiss hiss. Woof woof a woo. As the kobold mage barked loudly, all the kobold warriors immediately formed a protective circle around their three most precious kobold mages. All the kobolds looked around them warily. The kobold mage even raised its staff so that it could summon magic at a moment's notice. However, a minute passed by. Three minutes passed by. Five minutes passed by. A gust of wind howled and blew a leaf onto the face of the kobold on the outermost circle. It seemed that even the wind was mocking them for trying to outsmart the wind. Half a second later, as if realizing they had been scaring themselves, the kobold team immediately stepped out of their formation and began laughing as they barked. Woof 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 woof. While the kobold warriors began thinking of ways to pull the mine cart out, the kobold mages sat down beneath the shade of some trees. The kobolds all took turns to work on the large hole, and it became ever so lively as they worked hard. As gusts of refreshing breezes blew, one kobold mage could no longer stand it, walking over to stand there and order everyone around. Two remaining kobold mages sat beneath the shrubbery. The atmosphere was so safe and peaceful that all the kobolds had let down their guard. The kobold mage sitting on the left put down its staff and began chatting listlessly to the other kobold mage sitting beside it. Sadly, after about four or five minutes, it realized that it had been a long time since its companion gave it any reaction. The kobold sitting on the left turned its head around curiously. Just one minute ago, the kobold in his line of sight had been fine. Now, a black arrow was sticking out from its neck. Now, a look of terror appeared in the kobold's eyes, and it hurriedly stood up to yell loudly. However, the next second, an identical dot looking black arrow found its way to the center of its neck. Jet dot black colored blood flowed from the hole it made. No wonder it's called a premium grade noiseless crossbow. I think not even a sniper would have been able to achieve this effect. The two kobold mages had died without understanding what had happened and that did not affect his later kills. After firing the last crossbow arrow, Su Mo switched to using a normal crossbow arrow as he aimed at the last kobold mage and gently pulled the trigger. A flash of blood splattered onto the narrow passage. The last danger. Dead. When all three kobold mages had been taken care of, not only did the kobold team lose its commanding masterminds, 
but it also lost the ability to battle from a distance. The pitiful kobold warriors could do nothing except form a circle and howl non-stop as one by one, they were taken down by Su Mo's arrows. A twelve-dot-person team. By the time all the crossbow arrows had been fired, only four kobolds were left. Now, the kobold team was on the brink of collapse. Without making a sound, Su Mo made a gesture in the air and five crossbow arrows appeared in his hands. He had loaded them into the magazine the next second. Three. Two. One. When there was only one left, the kobold warrior suddenly imitated the kobold mage that had surrendered before as it lay on the ground in submission. Surrendered again. Looks like the kobold's urge to battle will disappear when there are too many injuries and deaths. As Su Mo sprawled on the ground and confirmed again that there was only one kobold left, he got an idea as he cut off the power to the electric crossbow and put it back into the storage space. The next second, a fine iron electric spear appeared from thin air. Su Mo held it in his hands. Oreo, help me hold down the fort. Su Mo growled out as he stood out from the ground. Now, the kobold lying on the floor spotted Su Mo immediately. At the same time, much of the fear in the kobold's eyes disappeared. Furthermore, in Su Mo's line of sight, the kobold warrior stood up again and stared unblinkingly at him as it held its spear. What's up? Want to continue battling with me? Come, come. Come over and try me. Clad in light armor, electric spear in hand, and dressed in combat uniform. When the two were compared, the kobold warrior looked like a primitive man. They were miles apart just in terms of gear. One step after the other, walking as the demon did. Su Mo did not stop moving forth. As the distance between them shortened, he could see clearly. The kobold warrior had clutched its spear so tightly that it had become slightly twisted. Its eyes showed a look of viewing death as a return home. All right. Come over and battle with me. When there were less than twenty meters between them, Su Mo yelled loudly and clutched his electric spear in his hands as he charged forth. The kobold warrior immediately followed suit and charged forth when it saw what was happening. The kobold that looked immeasurably weak turned its thorns into smashes when the two were just about to collide with each other. Thump. In the next instant, a low, rumbly noise echoed throughout the air and caused the very air to vibrate. He took the opportunity to kick his leg out and kick the still confused kobold more than three meters away. Amazing. Amazing. You are far from enough if you think you could hit me with this strength. An eager look flashed in Sumo's eyes as he kicked the kobold spear at his feet over to the kobold, signaling that he wanted another battle. The kobold warrior's dignity was greatly injured when it saw how provoking Su Mo was being. It howled as it climbed back up onto its feet and charged while holding the spear. The sounds of metal and gold clanging rang through the air. Su Mo merely defended and did not attack, thinking he could use this opportunity to practice his melee sparring and hacking. Top shelf bullet cut. Horse stance side strike. Cross kick whip. The kobold warrior seemed to have the upper hand as it attacked again and again, but Su Mo managed to defend himself and return the attack every time. The battle went on for another three to five minutes. As Su Mo managed to side dot dodge the kobold warriors, again and again, he changed his spear into a whip and hit the kobold so that it would stumble. As the kobold warrior's weapon dropped behind him, it decided to give up and lie down on the ground. Not battling anymore. Ha. Huh. That's all. That's all. As he felt streams of energy pump through his arms, and then looked at the panting kobold lying on the ground. Su Mo glanced at Oreo, who was beside him, in surprise. Ah. Have I already become this strong? A smile appeared on Su Mo's face when he saw the gloomy look on the kobold warrior's face and he took advantage of the situation to sit beside it. Oreo, translate this for him. Tell him I said. We can continue fighting once he's rested. No rush, 
there's still a lot of time left in today. When Oreo heard what Su Mo said, she trotted over lazily. And began barking in a dialect she was fluent in to communicate. The cobalt warrior had not expected Su Mo to not hold any martial virtues at all, bringing a translator along with him even when he went out to fight. When it heard Su Mo's friendly request, its entire being froze. Fear was evident in its eyes as it looked towards Su Mo. The next second, the kobold which had previously been sprawled on the ground utilized both its arms and feet as it tried to leave the battlefield swiftly. However, thump thump. The buzzing sound of electricity could be heard intertwined amidst the two thumps. A black figure flitted by behind the kobold. The buzzing electric spear seemed to have transformed into a bolt of lightning. When it came back into focus, it had already traveled through the kobold's chest. I said I would wait for you to come to battle. Since you wanted to run, I had no choice but to send you down, after he pulled out the electric spear, cut off its power supply, and wiped the kobold's blood off the tip of the spear. Su Mo sighed as he walked back toward the large hole to check the massive loot he had obtained from this battle. Black dot colored blood gushed from the kobold's chests and spilled onto the grass. As they died, he seemed to cross the barrier set by their race and understand the sentence echoing through the air, military.style boxing, it's so scary.